Ok, uh, velkomin inn á málstofu Hafrannsunarstofnunar. Í, í dag erum við nokkuð heppin, við fáum hérna tvo gesti til þess að halda fyrirlistur. En uh, það er uh, Jay Murray Roberts og, og Lee Ann Henry. Uh, þau ætla að halda hérna fyrirlistur ásamt Stefáni Ragnarsinni. Uh, Jay Murray Roberts er prófessor í sjálflífræði og vistfræði hjá Háskólanum í Edinburgh og hann stjórnar Changing Oceans rannsóknarhópnum og leiðir uh, European Horizon 2020 í Atlantic verkefninu sem er uh, viðfangsefni hálstofunar. Árið 2002 var hann tilnendu sem fulltrúi fyrir Sargasso Sea Commission og ég ráðgeða nefnd hjá Science Advisory Council fyrir skosku ríkistjórnina. Rannsóknir hans miða því að kanna sjávarvistkerfi með áherslu á búsaðamyndandi hópa svo sem kald sjávarkorala og hefur hann byrt uh, yfir 160 tímarið skreinur og er aðal höfundur að bókinni Cold Water Corals og hefur aflað tölvers uh, styrksfé til rannsókna á þeim. Uh, Lee Ann Henry er lektor í sjávarvistfræði við Edinburgar Háskóla. Hún leiðir verkþátt 3 í verkefninu í Atlantic. Uh, hún er sjávarvistfræðingur og hefur sérstaka náhuga á djúp sjávarvistkerfum, þar með talið sjávarföllum og koralrifjum og er meðlimur í vinnuhópnum Deep Water Ecology Working Group hjá ISIS og Deep Ocean Stewardship Initiatives um orkuöflun í sjó sem er eitt topik þessa dagana. Hún er einnig, fjallar einnig um út af samning saminni þjóðan um vendun og nýtingu líffræðilegs fjölbreytileika utan lögsögu ríkja. Stefán Ragnarsson, hann er sérfræðingur hérna á Botsjársviði hjá Hafrannsónarstofnun og hann er fulltrúi stofnunar í verkefninu í, í, í Atlantik. Það verður þannig að Jamur í Robert Spyrjar Svo tekur Lí hann við og að lokum Stefán. Svo. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. It's absolutely wonderful to be in Iceland and at rather an exciting time for somebody from Scotland. We've never seen as many things, including a humpback whale that greeted us. Thank you for arranging that today, Stefan. So my name is Murray Roberts. I coordinate the I Atlantic project title is up on the screen, an integrated assessment of Atlantic marine ecosystems in space and time. What we want to do together, uh, sort of over this lunchtime seminar, is talk to you about what this project's been trying to achieve. It's been a four, nearly a five year piece of work now, thanks to COVID uh, and extensions arising from COVID. Now, we know our ocean is hyperconnected and interconnected, and one of the big questions underlying I Atlantic and the design that I want to walk you through in my slides is thinking about how uh, the overturning circulation is a, an important driver of change across the Atlantic Ocean. If at the end of the project we can say something about how modulations in AMOC affect marine ecosystems and their functioning and their likely trajectories of change, we'll be very happy. But we realise that's enormously challenging. And we're probably not going to get there, but we're getting hints and suggestions that Leanne will talk about from the time series analyses of our project. So I think as we know, the ocean is changing at rates we've never seen in human history. I'm not going to go through that in detail. I'm going to get straight into what this project's about. But we know the ocean's warming, it's acidifying, it's running out of oxygen in key areas. How is the deep and open ocean responding? What are the implications on uh, the ecosystems that live there? We know that things that move throughout the ocean, you know, one problem doesn't stay in one place in the ocean. It moves and transcends enormously fast. And the work I'm talking about today has a heritage which Iceland has been absolutely integral to. There have been two projects, the Atlas project and the Atlantic project, that take a similarity in approach and uh, design and also have political mandates that sit underneath them. Stefan has been a partner in both and MFRI has been a critical player in these projects. Atlas is built from the Galway Statement that allowed us to collaborate seamlessly with Canadians and Americans. That ran from 2016 to 2020. We're now in the I Atlantic era under the Bell M Statement, and we can collaborate with our friends in the South Atlantic and share money. That's really critical. We can share not just our expertise, our ships, our resources. We can learn from each other, and that's through the Bell M Statement uh, signed in 2017. And I think it's worth noting that EU has done a tremendous amount in driving those political declarations. We wouldn't be where we are if that, that leadership, that political leadership hadn't been there. Now, projects like I Atlantic, I think we're very familiar with the European project landscape in this room. They're big, there are many logos on the screen, but what I always go back to in this slide is to show you that we have some of the very smallest 
um, organizations. This is one citizen scientist in Bermuda who studies humpback whales, from these tiny organizations to some of the very largest marine science organizations in the world. And that's the beauty of these projects. You can see the scale of the project on the right-hand side, the numbers of partners, the associated partners spanning the Atlantic, and the number of nations that are involved in these activities. My job is to introduce what this research program is all about. Then Leanne is going to go into the time series analyses in some detail and talk about a high-level summary of the ecology emerging from the project. And then Stefan is going to give you key results and outputs from Iceland. This is the design of the project. I won't go through in exhaustive detail, but our foundation is in oceanography, always. Same for Atlas. We found our work in the physics. We bring, we integrate the physics and the ecology. That's our challenge in these big research programs is to make that happen. We then through, uh, move through a series of work packages that assess ecosystems in space and over time. If we've done a good job there, we have information to bring to policy, to spatial and temporal management and protection. And clearly, overarching all of these things, good uh, capacity building, good policy and stakeholder engagement, and the important aspects of data management. So that, in, in essence, is how the work within the project has been designed and evolved. What is it that we're actually doing. So these um, priorities, these areas of work, a series of objectives you can see on the left-hand slide, we're going to keep going back to that graphic. The oceanography, the mapping, the drivers of ecosystem change, and so forth. I'll keep coming back to that graphic. But we've worked right across the basin. Look at the areas through which we're working. From the very north here in Iceland, all the way down to the, Mar uh, the Malvinas current and work off Argentina, to the tip of South Africa and to the Walvis Ridge. We are a very, very broad geographical project. Several other projects moving forward under this call haven't taken such a broad all Atlantic approach. We did, and we had to think very carefully about doing that. Part of our logic was to work with the black lines that represent where the transatlantic monitoring arrays are situated, the rapid OSNAP, North Atlantic arrays, the um, Samok and Samba arrays down here in the South Atlantic, uh, which have allowed us to start to understand in real time how things are changing. So our Atlantic works across all areas. We have a series of flagship expeditions. I'll show you one slide only uh, from this expedition to Capo Verde, which is our flagship expedition called Imarabolis II. Um, and we've enhanced the capacities of these arrays beginning in Atlas by enhancing the capacities of the OSNAP array to measure more biologically relevant parameters. So Atlas paid to put nutrient samplers in place, paid to uh, put pH samplers in place. In I Atlantic, we've actually enhanced oxygen monitoring capacity of the Samok and Samba arrays. And we're starting to see the results coming through from those investments. That was done in cooperation with Triatlas, actually. So, this is the scale of the project. And it works, I think, because we've worked terribly hard to engage all sectors. We don't just talk about engaging industry. I will go and sit in Brazil in industry meetings, and we will make sure we're relevant, and we'll keep that conversation going. I'm here in Iceland for a few days to work with Richard Wheeler, who's in the front, and Stefan and Leanne, on how we can take our results and be more innovative and really push the results, not just talk about the stakeholders, work with them directly. We're really serious about this stuff. So we work across all these sectors. The power of the international partnership gives us this opportunity to work at this scale. I mean, it's a ridiculous scale to consider working at, but we have activities and new data and existing data that we've analyzed in a standardized way from all of these places. Uh, to give you an example of this in reality, here are the two expedition leads from iAtlantic, Kova Orejas and Boris Dorschel. They're in Spain and Germany. And just a quick summary of the expeditions iAtlantic has either led or partnered with in a meaningful way. So not just you know, a little bit of involvement, a really meaningful involvement. This became so busy, despite COVID, we had to expand it over two slides. Uh, just to give you an example, and again, cross-cutting the whole Atlantic, we've had new data gathered. In red, I'm Robles, um, which was our flagship cruise, where we went down to Capo Verde with a Spanish ship called Samiento de Gamboa, outfitted with more or less every kind of equipment we could possibly fit onto that rather small ship. So we had a, the Lusso ROV from Portugal, Auto Saab, a British autonomous underwater vehicle, outfitted with a new environmental DNA sampler, seabed landers capable of complex measurements like measuring in situ respiration in abyssal oceans, through to camera landers to look at uh, scavenging fauna in the deep sea, through to more conventional box coring and CDD assessments, the kind of things I'm more familiar with from my early days in deep sea science. 
The project's management group alone is, takes an entire slide just to show you. I'm not going to give everyone a name check, just to notice at the top you have the work package leads, their deputies, and at the bottom, Stefan and the other regional coordinators in iAtlantic. And those regional leads were an essential part of our design to get the project to work. We also happily had three babies just in the project office of the iAtlantic program. And these are wonderful things. These constructs, you get to know each other so well. You become basically a family in these projects with all of the wonderful benefits and sometimes drawbacks of uh, a family. So in terms of a quick summary of what we've done, I'm going to run around this di diagram. Oceanography and ecosystem connectivity, our modeling framework is founded in the Viking 20X model, so a full Atlantic model run by Arne Bierstock in Germany, which allows us to see AMOC evolution through a whole series of climate force scenarios. That work is done. I've also mentioned the uh, enhancement of the arrays in the South Atlantic, particular putting oxygen sensors uh, into the South Atlantic. So that work, again, is complete, and we're seeing the results coming through. Didier Jolivet has worked in close cooperation with the physical oceanographers to look at how population genetics can be understood at the scale of the ocean basin. Didier's particular expertise is in vent fauna. We've also looked at deep-sea coral connectivity and seeing interesting results, particularly from the European margin coming out from that deep-sea coral connectivity analysis. This, I'm afraid, will be very rapid fire in the interest of time, and I'm really happy to talk to you about any of the details of this project. For mapping, all I can show you is that we worked at three scales, which really tells you very little. But I've got at the top here uh, a, a, an output from our landscape identification. We've identified nine novel, objectively defined marine landscapes for the first time at this scale. We've also added over a half million square kilometers of seabed bathymetry mapping, which was lost in people's drawers or available only to industry and locked away. We've unlocked those archives. Very proud of that achievement. And then working with habitat, uh, predictive habitat mapping, uh, that, that's very active at the moment. Um, at regional scales, examples from the Azores here, and then at very local scales, reconstructing hydrothermal vent edifices. I understand this is the French Prime Minister in the early days of iAtlantic being shown some of the outputs. In terms of the drivers of ecosystem change and tipping points, this, this particular cluster of activities Leanne is going to talk about and Stefan will talk about in the talks today. So these, uh, I should have said, these things, the blue blobs on the screen, are the things we believe you need to prioritize to run an integrated assessment of deep and open ocean <coughs> Atlantic marine ecosystems. If you do work in each of these areas, you've pretty much covered the obvious ground. When it comes to understanding the impacts of multiple stressors, our approach has been to work both in the laboratory, so keeping, for instance, deep sea corals and other species alive in the lab and running experiments. I've put some examples out from our work on uh, deep sea mining, looking at deep sea mining plumes on, on deep water jellyfish, periphyla, periphyla. But working both in the laboratory and backed up in, in the field, in situ, using landers, we started to see really interesting, coherent trends coming out from the work in Atlantic to understand the quite devastating implications of these multiple stresses. And if we layer mining onto the top, it's really hard to see how any of these ecosystems can possibly tolerate uh, the things that could be thrown at them. When we move around the circle to what we do with this information, how do we make that information useful to policymakers? We bring it into a series of spatial uh, domains, integrated spatial analyses. So in the very simplest sense, if we know which areas of the ocean are experiencing the most rapid climate-driven change, within which ecosystems are also showing signs of stress, well then those are the places we must prioritize for management. That's the very, very simple elevator pitch that's behind iAtlantic. Now, implementing that, doing that, is really complicated and full of issues that as scientists we must acknowledge. But at least by making the information available, in this case through an online GIS, a geonode, and now through work that's been led uh, from South Africa and Germany to create an All Atlantic Data Community Portal on GEOS. This is a, a kind of a Google for the Atlantic now. You can go into GEOS, search these data sets, and wherever they're residing, be it in Pangaea or ENA or another online repository, the GEOS portal will find it. So if you're involved in other Atlantic projects and you haven't come across the GEOS portal, it's part of the work of uh, uh, the Bell M uh, statement and the uh, Anchor project and now AORIA, the All Atlantic Ocean Research and Innovation Alliance. It's now just been launched in the last few days. So the GEOS portal is now working and please do share that. I'll end my uh, remarks focusing in the middle, the most important bit. It's all about the people, because we can do all the science we want. 
if no one's listening to us, we might as well forget about it. So iAtlantic's put a huge effort into engaging policymakers and informing policy processes around the world. I won't go through all of the things that we've done, but I will mention the Biodiversity Beyond National Jurisdiction Treaty, which is the biggest development in our worlds of deep and open ocean management in probably two generations, and that's not hyperbole. It's very rare the UN signs off a new legally binding treaty. In Edinburgh, we hosted a workshop and symposium that grew to 500 people to focus on that treaty. It went well, and we've been asked to consider doing another one in Singapore uh, later this year. So if that's something that you're interested in, because I think the expertise of Iceland and the expertise uh, in deep sea biology here would be incredibly relevant to the biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction treaty and its development moving forward. So I'll end by thanking everyone who's involved. I think the project has been great despite the implications of COVID and all of the challenges we've faced. And it's worked because we focus at all points in the younger generation and making sure we're fair and balanced and do the best that we can despite the challenges. If you want to learn more, a couple of outputs. There's a paper recently published in Nature Comms which takes the approach of these blue dots and expands on each one in more than I can do in a 10 minute overview. We also made a short film and if you want to watch the film you can scan that code or just click the link to, uh, we're on YouTube and you can see each of our work package leads are kind of talking about their science. So thank you very, very much. Okay, we have time for questions while I, I change the slides here. So if you have any questions for... For the end, Richard has one. Oh, goodness. I mean, I, I Hang on. <laughs> okay. My question is just, a, it's obvious that there's a tremendous amount of work done here. What, uh, what in the, the, the world of the scientific research did you think was really a, a surprising result? So what yeah, did yeah. you see that was really un unusual and you thought that is not what I expected as, as an outcome scientifically? Okay. That's a great question, Richard. In terms, I think what we've done in iAtlantic in particular is focus in on really, we, we've now brought into focus some of the things we suspected. So the sensitivity of deep sea species, we often hand wave a bit and say, well, they're probably sensitive, but we don't really know. Now we know. So the work in this briefing on deep sea mining and the work coming from University of Azores has, and, and over in Guillemar has really brought that into a sharp focus. Tied in, I think, some of the other very interesting results around Capo Verde, which were genuinely surprising. We went to Capo Verde because it should be oligotrophic. It should be a very low nutrient system and that would have been a great place to go. To We were working across space rather than time. That's a place that could look like a lot of the rest of the abyssal Atlantic because food supply there is so low. Well, when we actually went there, it was mesotrophic. There was plenty of productivity, much more than we ever realized. So that was an important result. And that result will be coming out in progress in oceanography. We're doing a whole special issue now on the results that come from that place. While I have the mic, and if I just have a second, there's a very big result from one of our uh, work package leads in iAtlantic from the uh, abyssal Pacific Ocean, which is a game-changing result because there's new evidence emerging, unpublished at the moment, but presented at scientific conferences, that the abyssal ocean, the manganese nodule fields, are generating oxygen and putting it into the Earth system. So in deep sea science, although it doesn't come from iAtlantic, there are huge discoveries and there are huge surprises, paradigm-shifting discoveries still to be made. So we can talk more about this, and in the interest of time, I think yeah. we'll keep moving. Thank you. Okay, Leanne. Yeah, do you, you can talk. Screen. There we are. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to dive a bit deeper now into Work Package 3. So Murray gave us a, a whistle-stop tour of the whole project. Uh, my role in the project was to coordinate 38 researchers uh, across various parts of the North and South Atlantic, um, many of whom are here in, in Iceland today. Um, so thank you, Magnus, Warshaw, Christian, and Stefan. Um, 38 researchers, many of whom, as Murray mentioned, were very early career 
and mid-career researchers too. So I just want to promote that as a sort of philosophy in Atlantic. We, we tried our best to make sure that some of the leading lights and gave opportunities for these researchers to become leading lights um, um, in the project themselves, and we're very proud of that. In this talk today, I'm just going to highlight some of the key findings we had in, in the time series work package, so looking at how ecosystems changed over time, and some emerging findings that we don't know what we're going to do with them, but we hope to do uh, more work in the future. So Work Package 3 conducted these ecosystem time series in all of those 12 regions that, that Murray identified for us. One of our jobs was to make sure that any analyses we were doing were as rigorous as possible um, and standardized across our 12 regions so we could compare, keeping in mind how different we've sampled our organisms over time, different time periods, um, and different methods and, and metrics we use. Um, so standardizing approaches was, was very difficult. So as I said in this talk, I've got some highlights of the project. I can't uh, review everything, I'd love to, but I'd be up for a day, and some of the latest results. So just uh, what the very first highlight was simply compiling the time series, checking out all of our data sets, our archives and our different institutes, and trying to really um, look at them and assess how good they might be, how suitable might they be to conduct such ecosystem time series. Some of us have only been sampling for two or three years, a new area or stuff, maybe that's not good enough. Some of us have data going back 50, 60, uh, 80 plus years, et cetera. Pulling all those together, we identified 72 different uh, ecosystem time series data sets across the 12 regions. They're so a fully Atlantic, um, a full range of marine organisms from bacteria plankton, phytoplankton, up to sharks, tuna, whales. Um, so it was quite a diverse eco, um, set of, of time series. We have data going back glacial um, to um, annual time scales as well. A full size spectrum and ecosystem types all covered. So. That's exciting and fun to pull together, but immediately, if, you're, if, you're, if you work in ecology or statistics at all, it's absolutely terrifying. Um, is it ever going to be possible to find a signal in this? This is really messy. This is a bit scary. Our reviewers watched us very carefully and, and look at us, examine us carefully, and I don't blame them. Finding the signal was very difficult. So one of our next uh, highlights I wanted to um, to, to just to mention to you is just trying to standardize our approaches. How do we disentangle and find from all that noise any potential signals? Are there signals at all? So we did this uh, in a sort of qualitative way, appreciating all the differences we have across our 12 regions and how we collect data. We set common questions for anyone analyzing the data. Um, and I've listed the questions here. We focused very much on salinity, temperature, and the strength of the AMOC circulation, simply because these were some of the parameters that were being forecasted and hindcasted in our work package one on oceanography. Um, to further, to help answer those questions, we, we coupled a common set of those ocean variables. And then, importantly, we developed a statistical workflow for our analysts to follow, um, basically outlining if, this, if your data look like X, follow this pathway of statistical tests. If it looks like Y, this is what you're going to do to guide people. So in order for us to um, enable the um, answering of these um, simple questions, but harmonized across our 12 regions. I just want to highlight, it is a highlight of that, but we rolled out that statistical workflow uh, over three days on an online workshop um, back in 2021. Um, I think Magnus is the only person who doesn't have his camera on. Maybe someone else, <laughs> not saying anything, but it's okay. We had 60 online participants, which was fantastic. Um, I think this is over Iceland's National Day as well, I think. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Yes, excellent. Maybe Magnus, that's why you turned your camera off. You're celebrating the National Day. Um, but fantastic uptake. We put all the resources online. Uh, I've highlighted in around a pink box um, the leader of the pack here. This is a Professor Pierre Legendre from the University of Montreal in Canada. Um, he's basically the godfather of the field of numerical ecology. So if you're involved at all in statistical ecology, you've maybe come across Pierre. Pierre led our workshop sessions um, over the three days, an absolute powerhouse in our project. He's also on our scientific advisory council. Those resources are online, and we're looking to do something maybe in the future with them as well. Uh, a third highlight is just overall, is sort of the modus operandi of our, of our work package, is to better understand what's driving change. What does change look like in the deep sea and open ocean? We know so much more about coastal inshore ecosystems and, and, and communities. We've been studying them and accessing them. It's much easier. 
some key highlights we had is across our 12 study regions, we generally found really abrupt change, changes happening at a certain period of time over the last few decades, particularly the late 90s and early 2000s. So this was across many more than just one study region. No matter what people were studying in their regions, this kept popping up as a common theme, which was interesting, um, suggesting what's happening in the Atlantic Ocean to maybe start these and trigger these sorts of changes. It's probably not one thing, but maybe there's something overarching to look at. We then look to our, our geochemists who are working on over paleoceanographic timescales, um, and they've sort of helped us figure out that maybe there's actually some spatial and temporal differences going on here between the, the study regions. And now there's a lot going on in this slide. Um, I do want you to look at the, the paper if you're interested in the, these sorts of, of topics. But basically what this paper highlighted for us is that depending where you go, in the North Atlantic anyway, those changes that are happening at the surface do propagate to the, the seafloor relatively quickly. The changes that have happened over this last, last century are anomalous to anything happening um, in the past few um, centuries and millennia as well. But furthermore, in some spaces, there haven't been any um, changes in surface dynamics in the ocean, and therefore we don't see changes in the benthos on the seafloor, but we do in the other couple of regions. So there are some spatial differences around here, and maybe some areas won't show that shift in the 90s, 2000s, others do. Um, coming back to the around improving our understanding, temperature was overriding, absolutely predominantly the major factor driving a lot of these changes, either directly or getting there indirectly as well. Um, we saw a lot of poleward expansion of, of fish distribution, and interestingly, in several um, key areas as well as study regions, we saw what we call a marine tropicalization basically, especially in the fish fauna and zooplankton, we're seeing a lot more warm water species entering areas where they're not typically found, which has a lot of different implications. One of the studies I'm just highlighting here was uh, one of our analysts in Brazil used ICAT data for the, across the whole South Atlantic, the Western and Eastern. And basically, if you follow your eye around these black lines, those seafloor and surface temperatures are, are getting warmer and warmer. And if you look at the, war the affinity of temperature um, of a particular uh, fish species, in this case in tuna, um, that uh, warm water affinity is also tracking that, that warm line um, of ocean water as well, suggesting that, yes, the fish fauna you are encountering in that region is getting warmer and warmer, just like the ocean's getting warmer and warmer. The same finding was reflected when the Brazilians also analyzed their demersal, their ground fish data as well. Identical patterns off, off that region. The third one is we saw a lot of environmental factors driving distributions and changes in diversity over time, but these are also intertwined with the effects of, of management systems as well kicking into place. One of them in particular that I'll highlight was our work off Bermuda. Uh, Murray mentioned Wales Bermuda. This is essentially run by one man, one lovely man, who uh, takes out his own resources, gets his own boat out and studies humpbacks, and has done for about 15 years now. Uh, based on marker capture work that we did um, with himself and us in Edinburgh, um, a work by Tom Grove, uh, we basically noticed a huge boom in humpbacks around the same, um, the same study region as well, around the same time. So there weren't too many clear environmental drivers around this, but there's certainly, you know, with the, the ban on, on whaling going back uh, many decades for most of, the, most of the world anyway, there has been a return of the great whales in numbers. Um, we saw humpback in your bay this morning, which I think was fantastic. And again, thank you, Stefan, for arranging that. That was lovely. The fourth highlight, uh, with this, this comes out of a piece of work we did to try and consolidate all the mess and the messiness we did in our work package to try and identify which regions we were most confident were likely to change the fastest in terms of our ecosystem. So what we did is we looked at the ocean forecast and seeing if the salinity, temperature, and strength of AMOC were likely to change. And we um, paired those with what we found in our previous analyses, um, what strength of a relationship was there between a particular variable and an ecosystem compartment like fish or zooplankton. When you marry those together, we were able to develop this kind of index or score overall. And it basically says that the, the regions we've studied in our polar our, um, or subarctic and subantarctic regions are, we have the most confidence in our scientific analyses. Some of the findings we had in our analyses in different regions, um, there was just too much noise. Um, our analysts weren't completely sure what was driving things, didn't want to say, you know, put a sort of bar on it. But when you look at the data that we had um, working through Stefan and his um, uh, team and the work we had off the Malvinas current off Argentina, 
there's pretty compelling evidence of possibly some direct links between temperature, salinity, and maybe even AMOC strength and the ecosystems we studied in those regions. So these might be really good areas to, to build up in terms of a monitoring for, for change, at least for the basin scale. Latest results, I'll just highlight a few things that I think um, are really interesting that you might want to, um, I'm happy to talk about more. Use of sedimentary ancient DNA. So we're now able, um, one uh, aspect of our project, our geochemists revisited old sediment cores and they're probing the sediment cores for ancient DNA in, able to, to, uh, in order to reconstruct time series over centennial to millennial time scales. I guess this, the text on the screen is quite small but over on the x-axis, you've got different study regions, different cores, and up along the y-axis, you've got different, um, I wouldn't say species level, but you've got different uh, taxonomic groups. So we can now revisit and unlock all these sediment cores that are in people's stores and actually probe them again to look for centennial to millennial scale uh, changes as well, just using an H a, a DNA type of method rather than we all, many of us have used microscopes and that's our job is to sort, identify, count, you know, subsample, sub et cetera. This might save an awful lot of time. It's not perfect, but we were able to at least unlock this potential as a, as a pilot study and we're seeing it more and more in the literature. Second one, uh, might the Southwest Atlantic be a cold water core refuge in the future? One pretty clear uh, scientific um, discovery we had throughout the project, I'm just going to fire through these ones. If we look at some, um, the region off, and off Brazil and even further off Argentina, the cold water corals there, the deep sea corals, um, Ophelia and other species, tend to boom when there's a weakened AMOC state. So typically in the North Atlantic, we associate the boom of our corals during periods of time when we've got a very strong overturning circulation. It's not a direct link that's, that's linking to other sorts of um, oceanographic dynamics. Um, and the same things off the southwest. So if we are looking in the future at a potentially slower AMOC uh, overturning circulation, that might actually trigger favorable conditions in the southwest Atlantic. Not so good for us up here in the North Atlantic. And that was work done by, led up by our research team in, uh, in Germany. Oh, there was more to that. So I apologize. There we go. Um, a third one, has an oceanographic regime shift caused a uh, regional redistribution of humpback whales? This is one, um, a study that took place right here in Iceland. Um, we had um, a series of colleagues from here at MFRI, Stefan and others, and Marianne Rasmussen at the University of Iceland and Tom Grove in Edinburgh, basically uh, conducting a species distribution model to uh, using various data sets, including the NAS survey data sets, and um, more local uh, observations of Husevik, and generated some species prediction, uh, distribution prediction models, basically showing there has been a shift in the distribution of humpback whales um, in your waters and, and further afield uh, over these time periods. The next slide will illustrate the major finding of that in terms of offshore density, which is your, the NAS surveys we've got. Overall, there's a lot of problems with confidence intervals and, and error. But overall, there's a general decline, at least in the numbers in, that are being picked up in those surveys. And you can caveat that how you like. But the abundance in the coastal zone, especially off areas like Husevik, where are important foraging grounds for the animals, are booming. What's going on? We don't know. That's sort of the next step. But um, definitely, there seems to be a negative relationship between the two time series. Maybe the humpbacks aren't coming into the same areas where the NAS surveys are taking place. Maybe they're moved somewhere else. But definitely you've got more uh, coming over time the, from the coastal abundance. And again, us showing up this morning and being able to see one out your window, <laughs> I think I'm, I'm convinced. The final one um, I wanted to, to mention, I guess, before I go into a, something that's really interesting that I want to talk about, um, is that we did a lot of work in hydrothermal vents on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. I think really appropriate to talk about today in terms of uh, uh, the Mid-Atlantic and potential uh, effects of seismic events. We found incredible temporal stability on these hydrothermal vents. The communities there don't change. Nothing changes, 25 years. In contrast to pretty much every other data set we looked at, which was all over the map, very noisy. Um, I, I don't want to say things are dull at Lucky Strike, but uh, they're pr relatively stable at the edifice that was being studied there. Um, again, they used the 3D reconstruction um, uh, to, to sort of map out the communities on their hydrothermal vent at the Eiffel Tower edifice. Incredible stability over 25 years. The only thing that changed it, the only thing that ch um, was able to shift what that community looked like was earthquakes, underwater earthquakes, seismic events. So I think that's uh, timely to, to mention today. Um, 
But again, they're, they're not as dynamic as thought. However, there's been some other hydrothermal events in that same field that are a little more um, dynamic. This has a lot of implications for deep sea mud mining. Going on to you know, potentially mine a, a vent field um, would cause um, absolute cat um, catastrophe in some of these anyways. They, they don't like change. They don't change themselves naturally. The final one, and I hope maybe this catches some of your interest here for those of you into uh, fisheries research, was um, some research taking off uh, place in Brazil. I mentioned this tropicalization. The fish fauna they're getting off Brazil are warmer water fauna that they don't typically get there, but they have over the last five to 10 years. That same phenomenon is happening in the same kind of um, ICAT type of stock species as well across the whole South Atlantic. The next kind of question is, so what? Do we eat those fish? <laughs> are they nutritionally? important. Will people still be able to make money from those new fish that are coming? What, what might we have to plan for? Now this wasn't something uh, that I Atlantic was set up to do. We hadn't budgeted for this. We hadn't planned for this kind of finding. So now we're on the frontier of, well, what do we do with this next? Besides writing up the paper, I just wanted to show some of the researchers um, down south in, in the South Atlantic doing this kind of um, analysis, asking the really important human dimension questions. So what? You've got new fish fauna. What's that going to mean for people catching these and selling these and the people eating these? What kind of implications might we have? And this study is now focusing on the socioeconomic implications, but also the nutritional consequences of new fish species entering the market. Um, a lot of text here, but this just emphasizes that trend in the tropicalization of uh, ground fish off the um, southwest coast in, in Brazil. And basically finding, I guess, the, the general gist, and I'll, I'm happy to share these slides afterwards if anyone wants to, to look at the details of the papers. But the key finding is the species they're getting actually, have, they're not as nutritious. There's a less protein content. And furthermore, they're already tend to be heavily exploited fish stock species elsewhere already. So they're appearing in Brazil, but they're also, uh, they contain less protein, um, among other sorts of nutrients. Um, so some good and bad other aspects to it, but focusing just on the nutrition alone is something that the, the team down there are really looking into do uh, in the future, because there is that really strong tropicalization signal. Um, and we have to ask that next question, the, the so what? So that wraps up my talk. Um, of course, I need to thank all the partners involved in Work Package 3. Again, 38 fantastic people, uh, several of here in the room today. Lots of people I wanted to thank up here too for the fantastic photos, um, almost none of which I took. There are lovely photographers that work in our, our work package. Um, and I want to pass on next to Stefan to give you the best part of the talk today. It's really all about the research that took place here in Iceland in our work package. So thank you for listening, and I'm happy to, to share slides or answer any questions. We have time for a question before Stefan starts. Uh, I have one. Uh, maybe not directed to what you're talking about, but something that I have wondered is that we see species migrating from warm areas to the pole areas. Mm. And almost immediately we start fishing them. They're escaping, you know, bad situation and we start fishing them. Should we give them maybe some time before we start fishing them? What do you think? So this is a fisheries research institute and yes. I'm not a fisheries scientist and you're making me nervous. <laughs> but I um, you know you're fine. Um, I think that the concept of rebound we have to consider a lot more deeply. Um, you know, the, the natural rebounding potential of some of these populations is, is different. Do we really know that number? Is it changing over time itself um, is a bit concerning. Yes, I always think we need to give things time, but maybe we don't have time and people need to work and they need to eat and it's, it's a hard call. I'm, thank goodness I'm not a manager, a fisheries <laughs> manager, because yeah. yeah, thank you. Anyone else have a question before Stefan starts? No? Okay. Thank you very much. No? Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk, talk about two research projects uh, that are part of Work Package 3. Uh, one is focused on, on um, the immersive fish and the other on capelin. So what I want to discuss now is to think about what are the, the environmental drivers to change for demersal fish stocks. Um, so if you look at the um, 
the climate indices. Um, is, so we start with the Sopolar Gaier, is that our bar ecosystem is very influenced by the strength of Sopolar Gaier. So when it's very strong, it stops the flow of, um, stop the flow of Atlantic water coming further coming north. So that means that the Gaia stops the water, the south of water coming from south, uh, so the water is less selling colder and more rooted rich. Um, when the Sopolar Gaia is weak, the Atlantic, the, um, the Sopolar Gaia shrinks westwards, there's a water coming more saline and warm and less nutrient rich water coming um, further north. How do I get the, um, let's see. So here you can see on the, um, yes. oh, thank you. So you can see the strength of the Sopolar Gaia. So before 2000, it was very strong. It got weaker until, two, uh, until 2000. After 2010, it gets stronger again. It's interesting when you compare this AMOC, um, which is here, the trends are more or less similar. There's a slight difference because it's not measurably similar. There's slight, you know, they're not, the measurements are not kind of in the same place, but it's very similar trends. So what is interesting if you look, compare this with um, uh, the athletic uh, multi variability, which is a red line, which is effectively uh, data on temperature. It's a detrended temperature. So what we can see that it makes sense when the um, sepulchre and the amokas get weaker, we get increase in temperature. Um, so it's better to compare this if we inverse the both indices. So instead of, um, so when these now, the Sopolar and Amok as the weakest when it's highest values and the strongest at each end. And this is, I'm doing that to enable comparisons with other, um, for example, with salinity and the, the IMF. Um, so, for example, salinity follows very well. So, we can see that when the um, indices get weaker, we get more, the salinity increases. And we can see that when the, um, these indices get weaker, the temperature increases. What we're seeing now in the last year, which is quite interesting, we don't know what's going to happen, is that these are getting out of sync. So we have the temperature is still remaining quite high, and uh, whereas the salinity follows well, the sopolar and the amok. So everything fits apart from the temperature. Maybe there's a greater lack in the temperature, Maybe it needs the time to go for it down. I don't know. Um, but the AMOC is for the whole Atlantic, so we are looking at large-scale trends like the other two indices. But if you use a normal temperature data, it would be more or less the same trends. So if you look at, for example, the um, trends in uh, the IMF and the better diversity, uh, in Sao um, we can see that the... Uh, here's the, uh, the green line is the AMV, and there's increasing. The better diversity seems to be, the partners which better seem to be closely matching with those AMV. Um, the, however, if you look at the subpolar Gaia, that's, it's get weak in here, it's more athletic water coming in, and then it gets stronger. So again, there's a, you can see that out of sync. So we, we may conclude, well, could this because the fish are more affected by temperature rather than other factors that are associated with sulfur dioxide, which is salinity and nutrient concentrations? Um, so, so what happens if you look at species that have warm water, affinity to warmer waters and colder waters? Uh, so, if you can take, so Magnus has calculated using the vasts software was um, to calculate the trends for uh, recruits. Um, for various species, so ling, monkfish, tusk, and whiting, as a species that are 
warm water species and atle wolfish, redfish, and spotted wolfish are species that are cold water. So we have this trend. So it's uh, so it fits very well. So we have supple inverted. So we have warm water coming in because the supple guy is getting weaker. So you can see here that it's when it's strong as here, these species, warm water species, are, are uh, low at densities. And uh, when it's very strong here, then it's weaker, these species boom. And the cold water species, when the supple guy, the all this hot water come in, at that water, these species uh, decrease. Okay, that makes sense. Um, we have the AMV, this is temperature. Uh, Right, so it doesn't, so there's a clearly a mismatch there again. Um, uh, so perhaps for the, so the warm water species, they, they seems to decline even though the waters are warmer. The trenches, the waters get warmer still, um, but still the, for some reason the, the recruitment fails and the species decline. If you look at solid, sorry there's so many lines on this. <laughs> uh, if you have the blue lines, this is salinity. So the question is, you know, it may well be that these fish species, warm water species, are more affected by transient salinity than, than water temperature. We don't really know. But it could also be that, um, sorry, this is just, that species, the cold water species, may be more affected by temperature than salinity. Of course, this is something we need to study in the future and tease out all the variability. Um, so you can see that this is the uh, kind of uh, the shaded area here. It's the area where, you know, part of the time series that doesn't quite uh, make sense um, for the time being. So in conclusions from this part, it's a strain of Sopolgair and Amok. It's absolutely clear that this is a major driver of species uh, composition and densities. You know, the, the structure, the the, demers, the ecosystem of demers of fish is very much influenced by these two major drivers, the climate indices, which are highly related to those. Um, and again, I mentioned it could be that more and more species may be affected by more wider salinity than temperature, and all the way, all the way around could maybe possibly be uh, applied to cold water species. And there is this mismatch. Uh, so is, if there is a, such a mismatch in the trend, um, what are the consequences for the marine ecosystems? Um, if you have a warming waters, but the salinity changes, uh, decreases, we don't really know. And they, but, but it's clear that this is an opportunity to look at the separate effects of temperature and salinity. So, so to the Capelin story, um, so the two parts to the story. First one was um, to look at changes in spawning habitats of capelin. So the question is, uh, it, we have here on the right hand side time series of temperature, and at around 2003 there was a 2003 and after. It's quite clear that the temperature has increased. Uh, Ideal temperature range, based on old laboratory studies, between five to seven degrees. So that means that if you look at some of the time series here, it's quite clear that in some areas the, um, the temperature went beyond that range. So if you look at the, uh, the distribution spawning habits, it's based on um, of capability that is fully mature, about to spawn, how is the distribution? If you look at before 2002, before 2003, we can see about, about half of the capelin, the spawning, which is right to spawn, is off South Iceland. Um, and uh, if you, for the latter period, there has been a shift towards north. So we have now off South, instead of 56% of South Iceland, now is 34%. And we have like about 65% of the capelin of West Iceland. So there has been a northward shift. The, the, um, the spawning uh, habitats are moving further north. Um, 
So we have all know, always known that, that cable is very much influenced by current dynamics. Uh, it's probably influenced by location of spawning habitats and timing of spawning. So we can see that, for example, I mentioned the disco pattern in the next slide. That here is an example of a similar larvae. Uh, this was a similar larvae that has been some of a bit transported westward. So this just to show an example. Um, so just to to show that how the location and timing of spawning influence where the actual lava end, there was Christie did some series of Lagrangian lava particle experiments. So the lava were released on the 40th or 9th of March. This is just to show a snapshot of those experiments, just to one example or two. Uh, and the lava was followed by 140 days. So this is just a simulated computer lava. Um, so if you compare the south, um, you can see that, OK, the lava is released on the, um, on the 14th of March. And five days later, well, and five days later, and they kind of, and also five days later, um, and over the time period of well, from up to 140 days, they more or less just circulate in the same area. They kind of, there's not a big difference between, you know, these two time periods. The lava, this contrast to lava that was released or two times, um, and fourth again on the 14th and 19th of March. So when the larvae was released on the particles, larvae released on the 14th of March, they kind of end, stay here in this area. Some go east and so forth. So they kind of stay in Iceland waters. Um, whereas the larvae who released on the 19th, a proportion of those goes to Greenlandic waters. So they basically captured in some kind of ocean process, some kind of currents that goes westwards and into Greenlandic waters. We can also, so this is a forward tracking. We can also look back and say, well, we can go from um, to a backward tracking that we have the lobby and we say, where, was it, where did it come from? And to do that, we can use various relationships. We can use age and, age and length relationships. There's a very good relationship between length and age. We know that. So it's, you know, if you have a the bigger larvae, older it is. Um, and there's a, just a very good linear relationship. So we can use the, um, that information uh, to track the larvae to the origin of the Hudson. So we, we have here the actual, the final positions of the lava court. Um, this is where we got a reasonably good number of larvae in this sampling locations here. Um, and then the first question is, okay, can we identify spawning grounds or hatching locations? Um, so we can see that, again, we can see hopefully the, the spots here, which is the location in, of the lava in the samples. And we have some, um, here the red, we have some hot spots. So the areas we mark the red are kind of hot spots of spawning or hatching. Um, so we can see that, well, the lava here probably came from here. I mean, this just seems to be so spawning the lava came here using ocean, various oceanographic information. Whereas the lava here, well, may have gone longer distance. So we can also look at the, the age of the larvae. How far did it go over the duration of time? Um, so we can see that in some cases, um, that there is a big difference in, in drift distance among like cases. So for example, these larvae here, they all seems to be, you know, these are like five to 10 years. Well, it's like um, 50 to 20 day old larvae. It just went this distance. Whereas if you look here, I mean, some larvae here went to very large distances. Uh, so it seems to be that 
you know, the local alarm, the settings, um, the currents and so forth, is probably very much influencing how far the lava go. And then finally, just quickly, because we have also very super good relationship between incubation time uh, and, and temperature. So we can use those relationship to, uh, to identify using also the bottom temperature at the site to identify spawning time. And then we can also use the age length relationship to determine the hatching time. So this is the graph on the right. So we, we can, this is a um, type of information that can be produced. So just quickly to finalize, there has been northward shift in capable spawning distributions of the West Iceland, and this is, seems to be climate driven. Uh, drift pathways to nursery grounds seems to be very much influenced by the location of hydrodynamic rhythm and spawning events. Um, so the also the question is, okay, if the location of the spawning grounds is changing for the north around, for the north, um, how, how is the survivability of the lava affected? Um, also, I find it interesting that you can use forward tracking to provide insight into short to long term time scales. And you can use back tracking to look at, well, where did the lava come from, probably in the short time scales. Thank you very much. And they, I'm, I'm presenting the work of Magnus and Kristin and others. So uh, if you have, have if I have said something wrong, or if you would like to answer some, you know, probably, you probably better you to answer those questions that may arise here now. Thank you very much for, for this attention. Thank you, uh, Stefan and, and others. Uh, do you have questions for Stefan, or Magnus, or Christine? Hi, well, I talked to Christine already about this because I'm very interested in the backtracking uh, but, uh, um, yeah, because one of the things that we want to do uh, is just to identify important spawning areas for different fish. Uh, but I'm wondering, this, this, the, the uh, algorithm that you're using, assume that the larvae are sort of like passive particles, or do they have any biology in there? Uh, it's a good point. Um, so for the most part, yes, we use the most simplest possible assumption is that simple drift was involved. I should mention, though, that for the forward drift, we did look at drift at different depths and looked at connectivity over to Greenland and saw that it didn't really affect too much the connectivity in the upper layers, at least. We also looked at um, uh, vertical migration, which doesn't happen initially, just gradually, but just assuming vertical migration starts from the beginning even. It was also quite um, close to the results of simply assuming a simple surface drift. But it's a, it's a good point because um, apparently, you know, uh, with increased length comes uh, different drift dynamics, right? So uh, it's something to think about in the future. Anyone else? I have a question for you and maybe for you too as well. It's similar to the question I asked Lian. I mean, we are seeing these shifts uh, and a vital part of this project is discussions with you know, policy makers and, and stakeholders. Uh, what should the fishing fleet do as a response to this shift we are seeing? Just Business as usual, or? Wow. Uh, <laughs> it's a big question, but a very good one. I mean, at the moment, like climate-driven shifts, you know, it, it, to start with, like ecosystem information in fish is not very much used. There's only a handful of nations that have, have actually carried out an ecosystem approach to fish management, included that information. Mm -hmm. So it would be kind of, I mean, what is a bit worrying to me is like, we have this shift, and so what's gonna happen about the, um, 
like Leanne mentioned, like one aspect is like, you know, the food quality of that fish, you know, and uh, the survivability in the new areas. Do we need to be more risk averse because of the shifts? You know, we may have to, we have been catching that cod in the same area for decades, but if that cod goes, it may have to adapt to the new location. So I would, yeah, I think would think that fisheries management needs to take that into account. But I'm not quite sure how. <laughs> That's, <laughs> uh, yeah. It, it, it's a really, really pivotal question, actually, isn't it? And it's so hard. But I think one of the jobs for I Atlantic looking forward is actually bringing across the understanding that we have across all these different regions of the complexity of the changes, but the fact that Leanne and her team are showing that there are some consistencies. And in one of the slides, Leanne presented that off Iceland and at the extremes of the distributions in the South Atlantic as well, we have more certainty, more confidence that these changes are robust. And we might need to be a bit braver as scientists in standing behind that and not being completely I'm not going to use the word paralyzed, that's too strong, but nervous about saying something. Because we are now proposing to put lots of extra pressures into the system, and the system is already stressed. Yeah. And I think that's a fundamental thing for Atlantic to get out there. Uh, it's really terrifying me as well, because I'm, <laughs> we're trying to write this up and make sense of it. I want to spend a day you know, really looking at that and a paper on early warning signals from these mm -hmm. analyses that we're starting to see. Well, what is it that we can stand behind? Because if the area is changing rapidly, right, the climate is changing in all kinds of ways, and the ecosystems are already showing signs of change and stress, well, surely we're not going to load other pressures there, are we? Hmm. Any final question? No, okay. Thank you all. Thank you.